In our last segment discussing polar molecules, we're going to consider the last two examples that are found on either table 6.17 or table 10.1 in either the Chem 2A or Chem 22 textbook. So if you don't have your textbook out and open, now would be a good time to do so. Let's take a look at the example of sulfur dioxide. If we draw the Lewis valve structure for sulfur dioxide, it has 18 valence electrons. We're going to see that we could come up with two different resonance structures for the molecule. So quickly putting them up here, two different resonance structures. And I'm putting them both quickly in place. And examining these resonance structures, we can see that they are equivalent or identical to each other. You simply take one, lift it up, flip it over, and you generate the other. So either structure can be used to evaluate what the overall shape of sulfur dioxide is, and then a discussion of polarity, whether or not sulfur dioxide is a polar or nonpolar molecule. So looking at this one resonance structure for sulfur dioxide, I see that I have one, let's make that pop in red, I think that'll be a little brighter. I see I have one, two, three electron groups around the sulfur atom. Remember that electron groups can either be single covalent bonds or multiple covalent bonds or lone electron groups, and we have all three of these present in the sulfur dioxide molecule. If there are three electron groups present, then those electron groups, in order to maximize their distance apart, because of electron-electron repulsion, they will again assume a trigonal planar geometry, as we saw in the previous example with formaldehyde. So I can redraw the sulfur dioxide molecule now with the knowledge of what the actual shape of the molecule looks like. So I'm redrawing sulfur dioxide showing its trigonal planar electron group geometry. Bond angles are determined directly from the electron group geometry. So we know that we have bond angles here of 120 degrees. All of these we could indicate as 120 degrees. Actually, I should clarify, bond angles are limited to atoms that are bonded together. So we'll put that bond angle of 120 degrees here because that is in fact the only angle that we see in the molecule. So bond angles 120 degrees, although not seen, these other bond angles would be 120 degrees as well. What is the molecular geometry of the sulfur dioxide molecule? Well, the molecular geometry is going to be determined by the actual atoms themselves, not the lone pair. Remember, we discussed that the lone pairs do not have enough electron density to get their photo taken. They're not dense enough to be seen. So we would just see points for where the nuclei of the oxygen, sulfur, and second oxygen atom are. So removing this lone pair so that we can focus on the molecular shape of sulfur dioxide, I see that the name that's given to this shape, descriptive of what we're looking at here, is the bent shape. So again, we see this term bent, this time associated with trigonal planar geometry where we have one lone electron group and two bonding groups resulting in a bent shape. And now we need to examine whether or not sulfur dioxide 
is a polar molecule or not? Would we consider it a dipole? In order to be a dipole, it has to have polar covalent bonds and it also has to have a non-symmetrical shape. So in order to evaluate polarity and removing the bond angles here for a moment so that our picture is less cluttered, in order to evaluate polarity, we need to take a look at electronegativity. Oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. Sulfur is directly below it in family 6A and has an electronegativity of 2.5. So looking at that difference in electronegativity, we see that the difference is one, placing it squarely in the polar covalent bond range, and we can indicate as a result of that, that yes, these bonds are polar covalent bonds. Oxygen is the more electronegative atom, so we're putting a partial negative on each of the oxygens. Sulfur, partially positive. So we've established that yes, it has polar covalent bonds, and now we wanna take a look at the overall shape of the molecule. So removing the electronegativity values here, so that my picture is not quite so cluttered. Removing that, and now just looking at the molecule and examining the partial charge distribution. I see that looking at the sulfur dioxide molecule, I have partial negative charge on this oxygen atom, partial negative charge on the second oxygen atom, and partial positive on the sulfur. Well, evaluating where the centers of partial negative and partial positive charge are. If they're in the same spot, then it's a symmetrical molecule and it is nonpolar. Even though it has polar covalent bonds, there's no separation of charge in the molecule. It's not a dipole. If those centers of partial negative and partial positive are separated by a distance from each other, then you're looking at a molecule that has two poles to it. One end partially negative, the other end partially positive. So partial negative charge on the oxygen, partial negative charge on the oxygen, the center of partial negative charge would be directly between the line connecting the two oxygen atoms. The center of partial positive charge, well, the only place that's partially positive in this molecule is the sulfur atom. So I'm having to move my hand to point to the center of partial positive charge. That means there's a separation, a distance, between the center of partial negative charge and the center of partial positive charge. Therefore, sulfur dioxide is a polar molecule. And I'm gonna fill in here that it is, is a polar molecule because it has polar covalent bonds and it is not symmetrical, abbreviating symmetrical. Therefore, the centers of partial positive and partial negative charge in sulfur dioxide are split from each other. It's a dipole. Let's take a look at one last example, and that is the example of carbon dioxide. And while I'm erasing the board, you can take a moment and draw the Lewis Fab structure for carbon dioxide. So while I'm doing that, erasing the board, hopefully you can quickly sketch the structure for carbon dioxide. And let me take a moment to build carbon dioxide as well, so that I'll have it ready to show you. Okay, carbon dioxide has 16 valence electrons, and drawing the Lewis dot structure for carbon dioxide, we're gonna see that in order to give every atom an octet, 
and have the correct number of valence electrons, we're going to have to show double bonds between carbon and each one of the oxygens. So here is our Lewis dot structure for carbon dioxide. I see that I have two electron groups surrounding the carbon atom. Yes, there are a total of four covalent bonds, but multiple bonds count as single bonds for VSEPR theory. So we're looking at two electron groups around the central carbon atom. And what do those two electron groups do to maximize their distance apart from each other? We see that information on the tables, either 6.17 or 10.1. We see that those electron groups will repel 180 degrees apart from each other and assume a linear electron group geometry with bond angles of 180 degrees. So our Lewis structure is in fact a good structure for the actual shape of the carbon dioxide molecule. It is in fact a linear molecule and it has bond angles of 180 degrees. So the molecule is linear and showing you a model of carbon dioxide, I have built this. Yes, each of these bonds are double covalent bonds, but in terms of VSEPR, they count as one electron group with those electron groups repelling or pushing away 180 degrees. So what do we give for the molecular shape of this mo molecule? Well, it looks like it's linear, right? The electron groups are involved in a bonding situation, and whenever all electron groups are involved in a bonding situation, the molecular geometry will be the same as the electron group geometry. So I'm going to put down here that carbon dioxide is a linear molecule. And now we're ready to determine the polarity of carbon dioxide. Is carbon dioxide a polar or a nonpolar molecule? Well, back to our criteria. Does carbon dioxide have polar covalent bonds? Does it have a non-symmetrical shape? Both of these criteria have to be met in order for carbon dioxide to be considered a polar molecule. Looking at the bond polarity first, just the polarity of the bonds themselves, and removing this bond angle from the drawing so it's not so cluttered, I see that carbon has an electronegativity. We've seen this now several times of 2.5, oxygen 3.5, and just as we saw in the formaldehyde molecule, that same carbon-oxygen bond, the difference in electronegativity is one, putting it squarely in the polar covalent bond range. So as a result of that, I'm going to put little arrows on the ends of these carbon-oxygen bonds and put partial negative on the oxygen, partial positive on the carbon, and another partial negative on the second oxygen. So partial negative, partial positive on the carbon, and a second partial negative on the second oxygen. I'm going to remove the electronegativity values now that we've determined this so the picture is not so cluttered. And we're going to stop and evaluate the second criteria. Yes, carbon dioxide has polar covalent bonds but it also has to have a non-symmetrical shape in order to be considered a polar molecule. A non-symmetrical shape means those centers of partial negative and partial positive charge are separated and split from each other. So let's evaluate the carbon dioxide molecule. I have a center, or I have partial negative charge, excuse me, partial negative charge on this oxygen, partial negative charge on the other oxygen, where would that center of partial negative charge be? Well, it would have to be halfway between those oxygen atoms, right in the middle where the carbon atom is located. So my center of partial negative 
is on the carbon. But looking at the drawing, that is also where my center of partial positive is. Carbon is the only atom showing partial positive charge. So I have a center of partial positive charge on the carbon, and I have a center of partial negative charge halfway between the two oxygen atoms also on the carbon. Whenever you have a situation where the center of partial positive charge and the center of partial negative charge are at the same spot in the molecule, you do not have a charge separation within it, therefore it cannot be a polar molecule. So I am going to write here, right, no for the second criteria and say that carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule, and I kind of did not write that correctly, so let's try that again. Carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule. Why? Because even though it has polar covalent bonds, it has PCBs, but, and this is a big but it is symmetrical. It is symmetrical. Therefore, the centers of partial negative and partial positive charge coincide. They are not separated from each other. They are at the same spot. They coincide and carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule.